Hey everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome to our webinar. So today we're talking about the top IT trends powering the distributed workforce, uh, kind of the new normal for all of us. Um, for those of you that haven't met myself, my name is Blair. I am on the Better Cloud team on the solutions engineering side of the fence. So I help people realize the, va the, the value in automating their API endpoints and whatnot via Better Cloud, right? Uh, in a previous life, uh, just prior to this, I actually was an IT administrator. So kind of worked my ways up in the trenches. I'm Jamf certified. I have been on the Apple side of the fence for a long, long time. Uh, deployed both of these tools as an actual administrator um, and a leader in the IT space and whatnot. So selfishly, I am very much looking forward to talking to these two gentlemen because these are the type of guys I would want to corner into a room and just pepper with questions. So uh, now I have a platform to do that. So I'm going to do that. Uh, without any further delay, I'm going to pass the mic over to our esteemed guests. Tommy, Alan, would you mind uh, introducing yourself? Tommy, we'll start with you. Uh, Thomas Stomley, I am the CIO of Better Cloud. Well, that was easy. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Houchins. I'm the VP of IT and Facilities. Uh, thanks for joining us today, and thanks to the Better Cloud team for inviting me to, to chat. Awesome. Thank you, guys. We'll get more into nitty gritty, gritty details of your lives here in a second. Um, okay, for everybody, some, uh, some, I don't know, rules. We are recording this, so uh, this will be emailed to all of you. You can follow back up on it, with it, send it out to whoever you want. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, I will be keeping tabs on what's going on over there, and we'll lift any relevant questions. We will have a Q&A, maybe short Q&A session at the end, um, so if there's anything super important we want to talk about that's not relevant to what we're talking about currently, we'll get to it there at the end. Um, and then finally, last plug, uh, both Jamf Nation and the SaaS Ops community are obviously um, some of the, if not the largest communities in the tech space. Uh, so please, by all means, jump in there, get involved. We are all uh, actively or active participants in both of those communities. All right, with that, let's get into the good stuff. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here because uh, nobody wants to just look at slides. Instead, we get to look at uh, our beautiful faces instead. All right, gentlemen, you ready? Let's dive in. I'm just going to start peppering with questions. Let's kick it off. Um, so I, this is kind of like a, a big question. So I'm going to kind of lump it into one. Uh, you know, where, how did you get in IT? When did you get in IT? What was your first IT job? You know, what was your career path? What's your advice? Kind of give us the, the elevator pitch of you briefly. Alan, why don't we start with you, sir? Sure. Um, it'll probably age myself a little bit, but I like to joke around that you know, I started my IT journey when MacBooks were still called PowerBooks and iBooks, and they ran on the PowerPC platform um, and really started my IT journey doing user support type stuff. Um, started off as a Mac genius in an Apple retail store. Um, certainly didn't take a traditional path, but it was very much a start at the bottom and work your way up uh, type of journey, um, going from retail stores to flagship stores, then to corporate and and kind of doing the traditional sysadmin roles and, and you know, kind of uh, evolving into people leadership and management. Um, so again, not kind of a, a blue collar type of approach, right? No, not necessarily any formal education, um, but a lot of learning as you go, a lot of certifications, that sort of thing. I, will, I love that story. It's I, very similar to mine, but um, what's like, since you kind of took the bluish, right, the light blue collar approach, like what's your biggest piece of advice, especially to people now, you know, kind of looking at tech and wanting to break into it and seeing all the opportunities, but maybe don't have the formal education and all that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big believer in when times get tough, that's when careers are made. Um, and what I mean by that, that, that comes from a different couple perspectives. One is, you know, certainly this last year, was very tough on everybody. And this is the perfect opportunity for someone to step up with some new idea on how to solve a problem, right? And from there, you can really build a career. Um, I'm a big believer in experience trumps education. Um, there's not a, a textbook or a course anywhere in the world that teaches you what it's like to deal with a server outage when users are screaming at you to get something up and running or your company's losing money. And so I'll take experience over education. Um, but you should also bolster your experience with kind of job relevant certifications where you can. Love that. Don't rely on one, but holistic approach. I love that. Tommy, sir. So I grew up as a gamer. Um, so kind of got interested in, and when I say gamer, this is really going to date myself. It was more about like the Intellivision and Pong type of games. Um, uh, Galaga, you know, was it was a huge favorite. Centipede, 
Um, but my uh, uncle was kind of a serial entre entrepreneur. Uh, he started a couple of companies uh, and was very ex uh, successful. And I was like, you know, he always told me, that, you know, this is a, a great career path. Um, you're really kind of putting yourself in front of where businesses are going to go. You know, everyone's going to use computers. Uh, so he really kind of pushed me into that path. Um, my first job was a QA tester. Um, and I, uh, you know, an MS-DOS system. I audit, you know, it's kind of funny because I, I automated my testing job and everyone just assumed I was lazy. Uh, and one day the president came in, they said like, hey, you know, I asked people, what do you do? Why is this guy working here? And they're like, oh, he's a QA tester. Yeah, he's really lazy. He automated his job and he just goes and does something else all day. And the president of the company was like, and you didn't promote him? Um, so he said, Hey, take this mindset and apply it to other parts of the business, um, that kind of automation mindset. Um, so I really got into managing our SaaS applications, uh, at this time, this is going to date myself again. Um, a lot of our customers didn't have internet. Uh, so we had a modem bank where we would allow people to dial in and, and, um, to our application, uh, if they actually didn't have, uh, an internet connection, which is kind of interesting. Um, so grew up in kind of managing those applications and security. Um, my advice to people earlier in their career is, um, really use your ears more than your mouth and like learn how to actively listen to stakeholders. Um, they're telling you what they need. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you have to take what they're telling you and kind of transpose it in what you need to do from a technology standpoint to solve their problem. Um, so that's one. I loved um, Alan's comments about education. Um, there's a, a, a gentleman in our company that is all certifications and he's hugely successful. And we were literally just talking today about how it's all about just never stop learning, keep adapting, because what you learn in year one of college is no longer relevant in year four. Um, so it's, you know, that, that model I think is going to change a lot in the, in the coming years. Um, so I love that comment. Um, and the other one I would say would be seek honest feedback from your boss and your peers. Um, it's most people are really kind of scared to give people honest feedback and you have to make people comfortable with giving you like the real stuff that you need to hear and be willing to accept it. Um, I think that that's, that's really important also. No, I love that. And something I'm kind of hearing both of you say is, and this is going to ring true, I'm sure for everybody, like the soft skills are way, your ability to learn, your ability to empathize, your ability to communicate, your ability to grow way more important than where you went to college, the, frankly, the amount of certifications you have, because that side of the fence is always going to be and always will be changing <laughs> and how quickly you can adapt and whatnot is, is arguably more important. That's such a great segue to let's kind of actualize some of that feedback and, and advice now in given kind of where you've come from and where we're at now over the last year ish, what have you really seen change the most? Like what about your job as an IT leader has, you know, changed the most in the last year? Tommy, let's start with you, sir. All right. Yeah. So definitely the CIO's job has evolved, uh, quite a bit, uh, in the past year with all the new challenges in a changed world. Um, I would say that, you know, definitely shifting to remote workforce and what that means um, is definitely a huge part of what we've done. Um, I think it's really accelerated like SaaS application adoption and it's made people realize that like, hey, we're not gonna have five or 10 SaaS apps, we're gonna have 50, um, this is the new way. And we gotta really get good at implementing, you know, these types of applications. Um, so that's definitely one part. I think the, the second part is um, really having to get prescriptive about helping people and listening to people's challenges. And because if we don't give like any type of insight into how to do things, people will default to what's easiest. And that might be with schedule 30 minute Zoom meetings and people get massive Zoom fatigue, you know? And so really having to like, solve some challenges outside of IT and just give people a way to leverage technology uh, has been hugely um, important. 
um, like, you know, giving people guidance when and when not to have a meeting, you know, helping people with some async communication tools. So you don't always have to schedule a meeting um, because people will default to something that maybe not be uh, sustainable. No, I love that. It's so, the, the Zoom fatigue, we'll come back to that here in a second. Alan, what about you, sir? What's the biggest change you've experienced over Jam? So I would definitely echo a lot of what Tommy just said. You know, I, I really love the comment about being more prescriptive in IT, right? Our role is to empower you to use the tools that we deploy. You know, it used to be, hey, deploy these tools, let the users figure it out. But now it's, how do you use them correctly? How do you use them to get the most uh, potential out of them? I, I would say in terms of other things that have changed, you know, we went from having a very known quantity of offices and networks that we were supporting in very controlled and known environments to overnight, you know, supporting everybody's house as an environment. And so those soft skills are certainly super important, once again, um, as you're helping troubleshoot and, and making people feel comfortable about this, the challenges that they're facing when a lot of it's out of the control of IT, right? It's your local ISP, it's your home network, it's all this stuff that IT really had no influence over. And so a lot of that has changed in how you support troubleshooting and supporting your employees. Um, speaking completely selfishly, you know, Jamf had the opportunity to go public last year. So a lot about our world has changed as we try to navigate um, compliance and, and, and regulations and stuff like that. And um, as part of that, right, continuing to figure out how we best support and provide value to our customers. I love that. Yeah, the the death of the perimeter, right? Like in the last year, it it's so vague and such a gray area now. No, I love that. Um, real quick, and this is something that'll be relevant to both of you. We were talking about Zoom fatigue, or Tommy you brought it up. With all these new tools and all these new processes and kind of this new normal, we're seeing this hardcore Zoom fatigue, like 3 p.m. wall, right? That we're all kind of psychologically dealing with. What do you guys think or see to kind of address that. Alan, why don't we go with you, sir? Sure. Um, so I'm definitely not denying that Zoom fatigue exists. It, it certainly does. The thing I'm not fully convinced of yet is if we're necessarily having more meetings than we did previously. It's just there is so much more effort put into making meetings happen today that didn't exist when we were all in the same office. You know, you used to be able to turn to your neighbor and say, hey, let's go hop into a conference room or you knew everybody was working nine to five in your office. And so what I like to look at for addressing something like Zoom fatigue is what can we do to minimize the friction and, and effort around scheduling meetings, right? I think that's where the fatigue is really setting in. Um, how do we, you know, leverage our, our employee resource groups internally and stuff like that and come up with policies and best practices around hey, you know, from noon to one every day, no one is going to schedule a Zoom meeting and, and give some of that time back. I don't necessarily think it's Zoom itself. It's kind of all these external factors. Um, the other thing with Zoom fatigue is I think we need to get better with our meetings. And, and that's from two different perspectives. One is the agenda, right? Um, try to provide your, your meeting content before the meeting. So when you do get into that Zoom meeting, it's all about the discussion, the decisions, and then getting away uh, from that Zoom meeting. And then also seeing what you can do to address the quality of the Zoom meeting, right? Invest in better cameras, microphones, lighting, change from Wi-Fi to Ethernet, right? These simple things that'll make it a more engaging and hopefully a, a less fatiguing type of meeting. No, I love that. Tommy, any points for us? Yeah, Nuggets that's wisdom. That's is a lot of great wisdom. I actually um, close my eyes every other meeting and it eliminates Zoom fatigue. That's a joke. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, ditto to what Alan said, you know, we just had a planning session with Better Cloud and one of the most, you know, the biggest thing that came out is like the meetings, the meetings, the meetings, and definitely everything that Alan said, um, you know, getting prescriptive with how we run meetings, making recommendations on like how, like, hey, this is when you have a meeting. This is when you don't really need to have a meeting. We're actually investigating, uh, um, looking at some tools to like get some feedback from meetings, just to let people give honest feedback. Like, was this meeting, you know, helpful? Could we have had this meeting in 
uh, you know, another way. Um, you know, that was something um, that we looked at or are looking at. Um, we were even looking at cameras that actually follow your face around um, something that IT is also looking around just, just to make it like a more natural experience and maybe be able to decouple yourself from sitting in front of your monitor uh, for a long time. That's something we're investigating. Um, so definitely, um, you know, ending meetings early um, or on time, you know, to give people a break, especially, you know, Alan, you probably are kind of like me where you, you know, when you open your meeting calendar in the morning and it's like 30 minute back to back wall of 16 Zoom meetings, like uh, it's, uh, it's painful. Um, and also um, agree with the, the flow time where we're, we're scheduling time for people to be productive and just not have to be on a call, you know, looking at somebody. Uh, I think that that's definitely coming back and a lot of people are implementing something where like, hey, no meeting Tuesdays or whatever day. So all great recommendations. I love how creative we're all getting in this new normal, right? It's stuff that we never, like no meeting Tuesdays, that never would have existed <laughs> the before time. Are you kidding? But now, you know, everyone recognizes, hey, there's this human side of, to business that we have to address. And if we don't, uh, the business is not going to be as successful as it could be. I love that. Um, okay, let's do a little bit of transition. Um, I know a lot of us would love to corner an IT leader such as yourself and ask some really more business oriented, like tactical type questions. Uh, so along those lines, I'm actually gonna open up a poll. So uh, everybody that's paying attention and listening here, this is for you. Um, this question is going to be who does IT or security or kind of, you know, your your particular team, but specifically IT, who do they report to? So I'm gonna launch this poll. You got three or four options, CEO, CFO, CIO. So pretty typical answers there. And then other, I'll give you guys, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 seconds to go ahead and, and respond here. And I think it's interesting, and Alan, Tommy, we, we were talking about this before, like how much um, of a culture shift that this response can have within an organization, like where IT roles really kind of predicates a lot of how IT is approached, the approach that IT takes to the business, right? The cost center versus enablement center, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, five more seconds, missing 40 people. Oh, oh, almost got 71% of the people in there. Three, two, one, done. Ooh, look at that other. Hello, other. Interesting. Unsurprising though, as far as the, the C-suite, pretty, uh, pretty even split there between CFO and CIO. Um, high level thoughts, Tommy, what do you think about the, the responses here? Are you shocked? I'm not seeing them. Oh, awkward, awkward. I probably should hit share results. That might be helpful. Hey, hey how about that? <laughs> Look at that. There we go. <laughs> I, I want to know what the other is. I know, right? If you uh, if you have an other, throw it in. Uh, oh, I got a CTO here. Thank you, CTO. Got it. CISO. Yep. COO, CTO, CPO. Interesting. Chief Product Officer, CSO. I'm assuming that S is for Security. Director of IT, CTO, CTO, CTO. Yep. A lot of CTOs. Al Alan is an other, aren't you, Alan? Yeah, totally. So um, it's not surprising to see some of these results. I think where where it's a little unique for us at Jamf is, um, you know, IT is very much customer service, customer oriented. Our customers being our employees, and uh, so we align with our uh, chief customer officer internally. Um, you know, he provides a great voice for our customer uh, of Jamf, but also turns around and shines that light on everything we're trying to do internally and really makes us think about that customer first approach to everything that we do as an IT department. So kind of unique, um, but love the reasoning behind it. And I think it just perfectly aligns with the value that we're trying to provide the company. Yeah, I love that. Uh, we've got a couple answers in here of CPO. I said chief product. A lot of people corrected me, chief people. Right, so having it roll up through HR again, kind of Alan to your point, a different stance on it to really focus on enabling people. I love that. Um, so, kind of speaking about that and how the uh, IT is aligned, how are, are you guys as IT leaders focusing on? And Alan, let's just stick with you since it's relevant. How are you focusing on aligning your teams to be in line with the business objectives, right? OKRs, the culture, the vision. What are you doing to to uh, enable that? Yeah, I mean. Uh 
it sounds pretty basic and, and pretty boring, but literally taking the goals of the company and making sure that every single project and task that we sign up for uh, on the IT side of things can be directly mapped to one of those items. And, you know, if we can't provide a great user experience for that, what other resources do we need to pull together to ensure that is that's possible? Um, you know, we're really big on if it creates more work for us, but provides a better and easier user experience, let's sign up for that. Um, but really everything that we do can be directly mapped to one of our overarching company goals. And I think that's super important to be not only a successful IT team, but being able to show that you provide value and strategy back to, back to the business. No, I love that. Tommy, same question to you, sir, but also uh, we got a question here that I think is hyper relevant. Um, what if you feel that IT is reporting to the wrong person? <laughs> and how do you approach that with from the bottom, right? And how, how do you kind of help steer that or redirect? Um, I can try to give a, a, a comprehensive answer that answers both. How about that? Um, so I 100% agree with Alan that if you want to ensure that your business is really aligned, you know, with the strategy and staying strategic, you want to have the same goals as the company. You don't want to have like IT specific goals. Um, so that's great. Um, so our goals are really mapped to our growth strategies. Um, and I think, you know, you know, anytime we went through the facilitation process of like creating the strategy, the facilitators are like, I've never seen people align to the company goals like this and get creative. Um, you know, so I don't know if a lot of people really do that. A lot of people are like, oh, we're, we're tracking these IT statistics. It's like, no, uh, we're not. And one of the things that we do is I, you know, we try to embed like IT people within departments and like really understand the challenges that people have, attend their meetings, get to know what their problems are. Um, because then if, 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 they, if you, you've solved their problems, if you help them achieve your goals, you know, they're going to bring you to the table um, the next time that they have to plan something out because maybe their goal shouldn't be a, a million dollars in new sales. Maybe it should be four million. And the reason is because IT helped us with a tool that was going to enable that. You know, it's all about get in there early when people are like really get the ideation stage um, to kind of really be part of that planning process. Um, so I definitely think that that is uh, one thing that's hugely important. Um, from the IT uh, reporting to the wrong um, group of people, it's, you know, you know, it really needs to, you, need, you know, you really need to kind of look at IT as being strategic and needing a seat at the table um, and that it's gonna enable every single team to make a big impact uh, make a bigger impact on what they're trying to do, leveraging technology. Technology is moving faster than it ever has before. Um, and that, you know, giving IT a seat at the table and say like, hey, we should re report to this group or this or that group, um, I think is a pretty compelling and winnable argument uh, that you can have um, to get your IT team in kind of that strategic alignment um, with the business. So... That would be kind of my answer. I'm assuming too, you, you, we're not just talking about net new initiatives and projects and cool tooling and whatnot. Like this holds true for maintenance and keeping the Wi-Fi on and like tying even the mundane back to company objectives and company initiatives, right? I'm assuming. Yeah, and, and with the new tooling of IT, um, a lot of the operational work, the traditional reactive work is going away. And so really what you have to say is like, we have a bunch of people that know how to solve problems with technology. We're automating everything that we do and kind of ties into what these products do. What else are you gonna do with these people? And it's really embed them with the organization and help everybody else achieve something larger. You know, the new model of IT, you know, you think of kind of like DevOps and SaaS ops and DevOps is really to enable uh, product to deliver product faster, you know, and engineering. Well, with IT, you can do that with the entire business. Think about the impact you can have with like making marketing, you know, be able to reach more people, making sales, be able to contact more people, 
you know, so it can be something huge for your business. Um, and it can really propel you to the next level as a business and create a competitive advantage. Um, so I, you know, definitely kind of the philosophies there. Yeah. I love that. And uh, again, I know this is going to ring true for both of you because I'm hearing it from both of you, but you, you know, it is not just in order to not be a cost center, we have to do things like branding and marketing and sales and internally to our customers who are our internal users. Right. And kind of go, going back to that soft skills thing we we're talking about before, that's almost more important than just the, the pure hard, hard skills. Right. I think that's a good transition to this next question. Actually, <laughs> what kind of skills are you looking for in, when hiring people, right? Like given that it is not the same as it was a year, two years, five years, 10 years, 15 years ago, like what are you specifically looking for when, when you're hiring people within your org? Alan, let's jump to you, sir. Sure. Uh um, you know, obviously the answer to that depends on what position you're hiring for. <laughs> Certainly kind of those support type roles, you're looking for those soft skills. Um, but also you're looking for their ability and, and eagerness to learn, right. And grow. Um, I think as you start going up the chain a little bit, you know, you start getting into sysadmins or network engineers, you're really looking for more depth of knowledge for that specific field. Um, still don't want to lose sight of those soft skills, but it, you're really hiring for a purpose. Um, I think as we go forward, though, you're really looking for people that have great backgrounds in automation, scripting, that sort of thing. But also, you got to look for people that are good at being teachers, right? How, how can you um, be a force multiplier for the company if you deploy something and people don't know how to use it. So finding those people that can be great trainers or teachers and, and really enable the business. Um, and also look for those roles that take away the more mundane um, tasks. You know, think about procurement. How could you hire, like go out and hire someone who's excited about procurement so your skilled IT people are focused on the things that move the needle forward. Um, you really got to pay attention to engagement when it comes to your employees. I mean, burnout is very much a, a thing. And I think you start approaching burnout quicker if the employee is doing nothing but, for example, answering help tickets, right? So what can you do to automate those help tickets? Um, bots can answer a lot of those, those questions and, and address some of those challenges. And that way, that IT person, to, to Tommy's point, now gets embedded with other teams, does way more engaging work. Uh, and really can show the value that they're adding to the company. Um, it, it's hard to, as someone answering help tickets, to say, how am I adding value if all I'm doing is fixing your email problem? But as soon as you get them embedded on projects and, and can really draw that line, it, it's super powerful, super rewarding, and, and keeps your team engaged. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah, I love, I love that. Um, kind of along those lines, Tommy, how, you know, given that, because I'm assuming your answer would mirror that almost verbatim, right? kind of given that, how would we get lower level folks like a seat at the table? One of the questions that just came through is, you know, given we want to, that's how we want to perform as a team, but IT is split up into three different organizations within the company. Like what do we do at the bottom to prove out that value up the chain? Yeah, I think, um, I think it goes to with use, getting the right automation tools into your organization and freeing up capacity to enable your team to go and interface with the business. Um, and believe me, once you understand what people's challenges are and what their goals are and you help them, they'll do the marketing for you. You, you won't have to do it. it. Word will spread very quickly about like how IT helped us achieve our goals quicker. And then other people will start engaging you as you kind of get build that trust within the organization for sure. No, that, that totally makes sense. I love that. We've got another question here that is a little vague, but I think, I think it, it, it fits here. Um, where do we kind of draw the line for like that scope of work for the IT team, right? Like if we're doing SaaS integration and automation and all this other back end stuff that's providing value on the back end, how do we then translate that to more front end stuff and getting in front of people to, you know, prove out that va the value, right? Um, the question is like folks performing in this role tend to get lost in the mix sometimes. Yeah. So, um, we, you know, it's just in super important for people to, you know, you tend to get just stuck doing these tasks that are, 
you might think are, you know, it's all comes down to alignment with the business goals and like uh, making sure that everything you're doing has that in the sights. Cause some people will do this because they've done this forever and they think the wheels will fall off, you know, of the car if they don't do this. When in reality, they're better served in betting with the teams and um, learning about those businesses and those challenges and, and solving those problems. Uh, I would definitely feel like that's probably the quickest way from that standpoint. Alan, I see you nodding. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what Tommy just said. You know, the other thing I would add is, is when you do get stuck in those sort of repetitive tasks, I go back to one of my earlier comments around careers get made when times get difficult. And if it's difficult to stay on top of that ticket queue or, or you're finding it challenging because you're just doing the same thing over and over, that's the perfect opportunity to identify that and provide a solution to it and, and really prove to your leadership that you're capable yeah. of moving from tactical to strategic. That's the perfect way to, to get out, to, to get visibility and, and progress in your career. Yeah. And, and, you know, obviously you're always going to have too much volume to handle it all. And that's why it's so important to get out there and interface with the, the business um, and get everybody in the same room and, and say like, hey, we've got five things we can do, you know, and you guys got 50 things to do we as a group need to agree upon what's the most important things. And they will actually, it's not really our job to dictate like what's most important to the business. It's these stakeholders that, that do. And if you do that, it's like, I mean, I, you might've done this too, Alan, where it's like magic where people will agree on their own without you. And then they'll kind of understand the, they've kind of walked in our shoes and understand what we're up against. And they'll realize like, okay, you know, and so what we've done, what I've done in the past is when you have that situation where there's too much going on, you know, we would have like an operational queue, kind of like a Kanban where we're having those operational requests. And then we'd have another kind of like medium to large project queue to where we had people prioritize. And we would say like, hey, we can only do three things a week. And the teams would all come in and they would make their cases, sales needed this, marketing would need this, but it would enable us to prioritize what was most important to the business. And we're not playing the bad guys saying, no, we're not forcing our team to work, you know, crazy hours on the weekend. And, and when you take people along for that journey, uh, they'll be very understanding. And they'll, as long as you're communicating and they know where they are in that queue and they know the things that you're working on are bringing a lot of value, they'll be 100% okay with delaying that project. If you just shut down and you don't talk to people and they don't see that, they'll get frustrated and upset and they'll put more and more pressure on you to, to do those things. Oh man, that like resonates. Like I feel that. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, so along those lines of kind of spinning our wheels and taking a ton, ton of time on stuff, let's, uh, let's ask another poll question. All right, folks, this is for everybody listening in. Uh, this poll question is, how long does it take your IT team to onboard a user? And the thought here is, from notification through we're done, however many tickets and follow-ups and whatnot that takes, not just I turn their account on, like that user is onboarded and I, it, they're, they're, I'm done as IT now. How long is that process, all right? Here we go, launching the poll. There we go. So we've got uh, a couple options, less than five minutes, five to 15, 15 to 30, 30 to an hour hour plus give it a, a couple minutes to, to trickle in here oh, a lot of responses on this one right out of the gate it's almost like this is a pain point for all of the it folks on the call <laughs> who'd have thought all right we got 77 percent. i'll give it another five ten seconds eighty percent three two one done all right let's share these results hey look at that Ooh, the six people that are under five minutes do you all work at better cloud and jamf or what <laughs> uh man this is so I, I feel this my average onboard in my last environment was about seven hours and we calculated that total ticket time so that was from creation through however many tickets it took. Oh, you didn't give me this. Oh, I don't have the right thing for this. Oh, I need this. Oh, well, we need Creative Cloud, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, oof. Uh, Alan, Thomas is not uh, on our list here. Do you know off the dome, what's your average onboarding time? 
Sorry to put you I'd on be spot. in the less than 15 minutes category, one of those first two. So our goal at Better Cloud um, was to literally get it to we don't have to click anything to onboard. And there's actually a Jamf feature that we're implementing that's actually going get to get us there. It's called Jamf Connect. Um, and these onboardings are no joke, you know, like it, we're scheduling Zoom meetings for security reviews, you know, for security training. And then we want to make sure that people um, attended those security meetings before we actually provision their access. And so the team has really kind of um, gotten creative at really, really, really doing a lot of automation and really pushing the products to the limit. Uh, so it's been kind of fun, but I, I just thought I would give the Jamf uh, folks a little plug there. Well, well and actually, that. I love what you said there. And, and when I say, you know, we're in that under 15 minutes crew, that doesn't mean that we're happy with that result. And we're continuing to try to find ways to reduce that. Um, I definitely foresee a future where as soon as HR creates that record in the, you know, HR management system, we're done. Like IT is not yeah. involved at all. Yeah. Um, it's very yeah. real. The, the new metric, zero touch tickets, right? We don't want to touch anything. Yep. I love that. I love that. Uh, a couple questions coming in that I'll pop off here in a second. But uh, Alan, I actually have a question directly for you. Um, and this was given to us by my IT team, because again, we're all super <laughs> curious. Um, 2020, 2021 has really put constraint on the supply chain and the logistics of getting hardware to people that we can't get in front of, right? Um, we're curious, like for you guys, what does that look like from a logistics standpoint for your remote workforce, specifically in regards to the endpoint? Hmm, that's a, a great question. Um, so, you know, it, it's certainly a blessing and a curse that we are 100% Apple, right? We know the one one stop shop that we're going to get our employee hardware, but also if there's constraints with that, we really feel it and we feel it hard. Um, and this last year with everybody, you know, being forced to work from home, so many companies out there were scrambling to buy laptops and portable devices. And, and we felt that same pressure. Um, not that that wasn't what we were already deploying, but that it became much harder to come by those devices because everybody else is now buying them. And so, um, you know, if you go to pre pandemic times, you could order something and it's at the employee's doorstep two to three days later. Um, now we are looking at, you know, three to six weeks between the time to order to the time of delivery. And so we've been high growth, even through the pandemic. And the way that we have tackled this is we've partnered with companies that allow us to warehouse hardware with them. And so we'll make large orders, you know, 20, 50 MacBooks, and they'll warehouse it for us. And then we simply go to a portal and say, all right, take that item that we kind of pre-purchased and drop ship it to this location. Um, we are all about zero touch deployments and having that great employee unboxing experience. And when you're in high growth and, and super constrained supply chains, you got to really look for these kind of unique uh, solutions like warehousing. Um, our next step and the thing that we're excited about is how do you now turn that into a completely hands-off IT approach where maybe that new employee or that employee that, you know, qualifies for a refreshed device, how can they go to a portal and say, ship this to me? And that automatically ties into procurement. Uh, on the back end, a FedEx label is automatically generated to return their old device. Um, there's just, there's a lot of op exciting opportunity around that. Um, but ultimately we were faced with the same supply chain uh, constraints we partnered up with some companies that allow us to warehouse because the last thing we want to do is warehouse in our own office and have to send employees in to, to get hardware and ship it out. And, you know, it's all about minimizing that human contact right now. So warehousing, and then we're super excited about the future of automation around ordering procurement and return shipping. I love that. Uh, we've got a couple of people asking for names of those warehousing companies. So we'll, we'll throw that up in the community, everybody, because <laughs> uh, might be a little uh, hot button item right there. Um, no, thank you, Alan. That's, that's super helpful. It's, it's, it's helpful to know that, you know, people at the top of the game, especially like in the Apple space, are experiencing a lot of the same issues all of us are experiencing, right? <laughs> oh, man. Um, you know, this is a question we've already got a couple times uh, here in the chat how you know we are each both better cloud and jamf leaders in our respective spaces like i just said how are we using our own products to to push the needle forward internally uh alan you've talked for too much tommy let's go over to you for, for now. <laughs> so um we have a program called drink your own champagne and 
our job is really like push the absolute limits of what we can do. And like I said, I th we, we think we're close to um, getting a zero touch experience for when a user gets their equipment for onboarding. We're now working on like mid life cycle changes. Like, hey, when you change from this role to this role, what's all the things that have to be deprovisioned, provisioned, you know, and all, you know, there's a lot of different scenarios that you have to take into consideration. And so like, we're definitely pushing those limits. Um, you know, um, trying to push a lot of zero touch tickets, um, really zero touch everything. Uh, you know, that's kind of what we've um, really do. And then uh, when we're pushing the limits, you know, sometimes we run into issues with product limitations naturally, because we're doing a lot of kind of crazy stuff and we try to interface with product and let them know it's like, hey, this is what we're trying to do. It would be awesome if the product did this. So that's kind of our MO. I love that. In fact, that's one of the questions we got here in the chat is, you know, as IT leader, leaders in your respective IT software companies, what advice would you give to folks in, you know, our positions, kind of your underlings, as it were, as it relates to being involved in product decision making and road mapping and all that? Alan, I'll, let's switch to you, sir. Yeah, it's a, a great question. And there's, I don't think there's necessarily a, a one answer fits all, but it's all about driving value, not only value to your team, value to the business and ultimately value to the customer. And as long as you can come to the table with answers to that, you know, you'll find your seat, you'll find the buy-in and approval of your higher ups to get that work done. Yeah, I love the the value piece. It cannot be overstated, right? We have another question, right? How would you go and you know get your higher ups to pay for stuff to get to zero touch, right? Hey, we don't work at Upjamp and Better Cloud. How do we go pay money for this? And it goes back to ex what you exactly just said. Like we need to provide the value not only for oh, it's going to save IT time. That's great, but what is it going to do for the rest? Of, like that is going to enable things for the company. You've got to explain that and connect those dots. If your end user doesn't know that you having more time is going to enable you to do stuff for them they're not going to figure that out on their own. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. I love that. Um, okay. So you, uh, we've talked about this a couple of times. We have massive communities, right? Uh, the Jamf Nation is uh, second to none, I want to say, right? SaaS ops community, also uh, one of the largest uh, tech ops communities out there. Um, what have you learned from your communities? Alan, let's start with you, sir. Yeah. Um... So quick plug for Jamf Nation. Thank you. Um, and I would encourage anybody that's listening to sign up. It's a totally free uh, product. It's free to, to join and, and learn from other uh, sysadmins around the world on how to manage Apple devices. Um, so what have we learned at Jamf? Um, everything, right? Um, our customers and our community drive how we do everything from a product standpoint. They let us know when things are working, they let us know when things are broken, and they let us know about the challenges that we can solve. As an IT team, we're on the we're on Jamf Nation as well. Um, and what I like about Jamf Nation and sort of our overall approach to IT is IT should really be treated as open source, right? Every company is facing the same exact challenges. The environment might be slightly different but there's nothing to gain by hiding how you solve these challenges. So get out there and share and learn from each other. And that's what the community has really done for us. Um, it could be real simple things like how to automate setting up, you know, exchange accounts, but it could also be super complex. And when you can go to a one-stop shop and get answers to all of those and actually post questions and get responses and share scripts, it's awesome. Right. And I'd encourage everybody to do that and take part in that. I think that was a mic drop answer to where I don't know if I need to say anything. <laughs> I feel that. No, that's so true. And we, you, it's felt on both ends of that relationship, right? Like we feel it internally of, okay, our community, we can rely on them. We can get feedback from them. Like we can make our product better for them. But then on the flip side of those of us in the community, right? Speaking of someone who's been a member of JMAC and gone, you know, multiple years or whatever, um, the, the, vision and kind of the the pitch that the company has of we're going to invest in you our people right is it can't be overstated right and we've talked i'm sure both of you have had these conversations with prospects and customers and clients of you know we're with you because of who you are as a company as a vision and whatnot because of this community because of the open sourceness alan that you were just talking about um again the soft skills you as a company bring to the table are arguably more important than the the actual functionality not true, but arguably. 
Yeah, and uh, if I could okay. add to that real oh, sorry, quick, um, you know, I, I think you you have to build that trust and transparency with your community. And the more you do that, the easier it makes it for you because there are going to be times that you mess up. And when you do, your community is not just going to grab their pitchforks, right? They're going to be understanding. They're going to work with you towards a solution or, you know, tell you where you messed up in a maybe not so hateful way. And that's always super appreciated because nobody's perfect. No company's perfect. Uh, but showing your trust, your transparency and showing them that you're there to, to help them solve their challenges and address their needs goes a long way. Yeah. And it's just super important to be authentic, right? I mean, like, like Alan said, you can't be Superman. You can't, you know, you have to be empathetic to your, to your users and just listen. You know, it's another one of those situations where you just really need to listen. Listening. It's like the number one answer to every, all of life's problems. Listen more. <laughs> um, actually, that's it's kind of a great segue. So speaking of listening and being able to do that, uh, let's get a little bit more tactical organizationally again. Uh, Going to launch another poll question for everybody listening. This one is all about the ratio of end users you support to IT staff you have. A little ambiguous, but you guys kind of understand the, the question there. Um, Obviously, Alan, Tommy, I don't need to preach this to you, but especially in the advent of 2020 and SaaS explosion and all that, uh, this ratio is getting worse. <laughs> it is in, this, in the sense of we have to support more people than we've ever had to support, and that number is only increasing, right? Now, granted, we get all these tools, we get all this cool stuff, but at the end of the day, if it's all about these soft skills and all about these relationships and all this stuff, that still revolves around how many people I'm overseeing. Uh, two more minutes or a minute and a half minute for everybody uh, answering. We got 60% answered here. Uh, 62, 65, 15 seconds. Can we hit 70, 66, 67? Guys, I feel like I'm watching the GME stock right now. 68, 69. Let's all go. Uh, uh, uh. Somebody else. There we go. Okay, we're done. Let's share these results. Yeah. This, wow, the 14 of you with 50 to one. Congratulations, you guys. <laughs> oh man, uh, does this, how's this feel? Just looking at these results, Tommy Allen, I see nodding of heads. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's kind of like uh, on one hand, like you definitely want to eliminate the operational load of your tickets and be able to support a lot, a large amount of users using automation and um, offboarding a lot of that work. But on the other hand, I, you know, you should never take these technologists that can solve people's problems and just say like, Hey, we don't need you anymore. Your redundancy. It's all about repurposing those people and being more strategic. And then that kind of, you know, really justifies having more IT people to actual people in the company um, if those people are actually strategic in nature um, and are going to just enable the business to achieve more um, leveraging technology. So uh, it's interesting to see those ratios. Yeah. And then, you know, this is a question that just got thrown into the chat, but it's so relevant, right? Do we need less money for tools, but that means we need more people or, you know, like what's that that ratio of not end users to IT people, but tooling automation to actual people to take care of like the relational side of things. I don't think we'll ever have a definitive answer for that. <laughs> um, so along these lines of kind of keeping things, you know, tactical to the business, and we, we've hit on this a lot, but how do you guys ensure that the decisions you're making for technology are in fact <laughs> mapped to those strategic business initiatives, right? Like what are you guys doing to kind of, to, check yourself on that and, and make sure you are in fact moving in the right direction. Tommy, let's uh, stick with you, sir. Yeah. I mean, as we kind of stated earlier, a little bit earlier, it's really just mapping your goals specifically to the company's growth strategies, the company's goals. And, um, you know, it takes creativity sometimes to map everything properly, but once you do, you know you're on the right track. You know, if it's a win for you, if it's a win for the company, if it's a win for your, your, your employee's career growth, you know you're on the right track. And naturally people will be motivated. It'll make things a lot easier because people will be able to see the tangible value. Um, the team will be viewed in a different light as a strategic partner. Um, 
you know, so that's, you know, definitely mapping, mapping to those strategies. Alan, do you guys use any metrics or, you know, how do you measure that, that success? I, I mean, CSAT or customer satisfaction is obviously the number one uh, way to measure that. And, and that can be done through a number of channels. First and foremost, just talking with your, your customers and, and seeing how you're doing, checking in with leaders across the, the org and, and across the company, but also just simple things like a survey after a, a help ticket's been resolved, lets you know a lot about how you're performing. Um, yeah, CSAT to me is, is kind of king when you're, um, you're a customer oriented department and it is that through and through. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love taking CSAT and then mapping it to other things. Like how long did it take to close that ticket? How many times did we reach out to that person? Right. And look at for the correlations of, oh, if we can stream up this process to make sure our touch points are less, the satisfaction is going to go through the roof. Hey, that doesn't even require anybody, right? Those types of connections that again, goes back to the branding and the marketing and being a salesperson to your internal users. Those aren't really IT functions per se, right? Very, very interesting. I love that. Um, okay, as we wrap up, I wanna, we have a couple questions I do want to get to here at the end. But as uh, we start to wrap up here, final question before Q&A. Uh, as you look out on the next year slash whatever the new normal is going to be, what is your kind of top priority? Obviously, enabling our end users to tie into OKRs, but like kind of looking out this next year, what, what are you taking on project number one? Tommy, let's start with you, sir. Yeah, so um, definitely trying to take automation to the next level um, because I think that you know, our CEO uh, has really seen the value of pushing people into the business and the problems that they solve, and he wants more of that. And so to do that, we have to continue to automate. Uh, the other piece is just... Um, you know, as part of managing all these SaaS apps and the growing SaaS apps, it's really making sure that, that data, that we're not creating data silos, making sure that that data, um, that there's one single source of truth uh, and it's at people's fingertips where they need to make decisions like pushing data to what, you know, one click away from one where they want to, you know, to make a decision, you know, where, where they have to make a decision because um, if it's one click away, if you don't have to open Tableau, uh, you know, you're really going to increase the chance of a data-driven um, decision. So um, leveraging those things. Um, also, we're just really working on changing how we operate and how we implement technology across the entire org, you know, because technology is so, it's so intertwined with operations now. Um, you know, I feel like the CIO and the COO role are, are very similar in that fact and that we want to make sure that when we're implementing that we're not affecting downstream, we're not creating processes in a silo, we're not creating data in a silo. Um, so really fine tuning and, and making the way that we implement technology a capability that's repeatable that we can do over and over, because ultimately, like we want to continuously implement technology and continue to bring business um, value to the business as technologists. So uh, that I love that. That's amazing. Alan, number one priority for you in this uh, new normal? Yeah, so I would definitely echo a lot of what Tommy just said, 100%. Um, for myself, personally, I, I love my role and I have such a unique opportunity at Jamf because I get to work with the IT side of the house and the facility side of the house. And so our top priority is um, you know, not only ensuring safety when it, it, when it's the right time for employees to come back, but it's really about this new hybrid or distributed work model and what we can do to maintain a level playing field, regardless of where someone decides to work. Um, we, you know, the, the office is no longer the place that you're expected to get work done. Uh, it's there for you if you want to use it as a service and, and use the services within that office. And so if you look at the last year, right, Zoom kind of became the great equalizer for everybody. Everybody has their own square in a meeting. Uh, a lot of people that normally wouldn't have spoken up in a meeting have now found their voice. And that's the last thing we want to lose when we go back to half of our team being in the office and the other half, you know, deciding to continue to work from home. And so what sort of technologies, uh, processes, uh, prescriptive best practices can we come up with to really uh, support that hybrid work environment. And that's the type of stuff that we're really excited about and making a priority. Man, the, the, the new IT, half 
you know, branding, half marketing, half psychologist. <laughs> a lot of halves there. <laughs> so good. So good. All right. That is the conclusion of my set list of questions that we uh, wanted to cover. I do have some actually some really helpful, um, I think, Q&A questions. Uh, so let's dive into those real fast here in the next uh, five or so minutes, and then uh, we'll wrap things up. So the first one I got, um, given this new distributed workforce, what is your um, number one kind of security concern about having a distributed workforce? Alan, let's start with you, sir. Sure. Um, I mean, obviously there's a lot of concerns with the fact that you're now supporting hundreds, if not thousands of unique environments. Uh, I think in order to do so, you really need to look at cloud-based IDPs, cloud-based workflows, and really adopt a, a zero trust approach to all access. Um, you know, assuming something's on-prem is, is no longer a, a great, uh, security posture, um, approaching everything with the zero trust, basing it not only on the identity of, of who's trying to access what, but also the state of the device as they're trying to access it and, and layering your security model on that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Ditto that on the zero trust. Um, just a lot of attacks, you know, that are happening are happening outside the perimeter, even before um, the, the pandemic. Um, a lot of the attacks, people do a lot of reconnaissance out off network because you know why attack people in the office where we have all this control and visibility you know as opposed to home and this makes it so much easier for you know you're always at home so they know you know they can always kind of hit you up when you're working and see what they can do so um ditto on the zero trust part of that i love that man we've got some great questions that we're not going to have time for uh, i do want to touch on one more before we wrap here at the end um, if you weren't doing something called IT, what would you be doing? A uh, food blogger for me. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Alan? Yeah. Anybody that knows me knows I live in the middle of nowhere. I enjoy my outdoors time, uh, hunting, fishing. So I try to be an outfitter or something along those lines. Maybe a farmer. Oh, the uh, Alan, farmer. Alan, when you when you um, said that you had to support people in their houses, you forgot you failed to mention Ann Barnes. <laughs> it's very true. Um, there are people, and uh, I'll certainly put myself into this, that their neighbors are actually Amish, and they're the only people that are connected to the grid, which provides some very unique challenges when you try to work remotely. Yeah. Didn't you didn't you say your 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 office is in a outdoor a barn kind of setup? Yeah, absolutely. I live in a retrofitted barn. So, uh, and it's in the middle of nowhere. I'm on a four meg down 512 K up internet connection. So that's amazing life. <laughs> I love that. That's fantastic. Goodness. Now it makes my gigabit connection. Uh, and what I complain about constantly <laughs> seem like a how dare you? <laughs> yeah. Right? It made your first world problem. All right, guys, we are out of time. Hey, I really appreciate the two of you coming in and answering these questions. Like I said at the beginning, self, completely selfishly, this is exactly what I would have wanted to do you know, in real life in the aftertime. So thank you so much. Uh, to everybody that joined us, thank you for joining. Um, let's keep this conversation going. We have, like we've said a couple of times, some pretty great communities out there. Uh, whether it's the SaaS Ops community, whether it's Jamf Nation, um, please, please, please join us, join the con uh, conversation. Next week, same time, same place. Uh, we will be doing a meetup. So feel free to jump in and join us. It'll be a lot more informal. Uh, we'll be covering kind of the more tactical stuff of, you know, like how do Jamf and Better Cloud solve these problems in product? Um, and, you know, we'll keep it, you know, collaborative and conversational. Alan, Tommy, I really appreciate it. Thank you, sirs. Thanks, Blair. Thanks, Blair. Thanks, thanks Alan. All right, everyone. Have a good rest of your week. <laughs>